Good morning. Uh, my name is Katie Barker. I am on the board here at Discovery Church, and I am preaching this morning from my home office because California is still under the shelter-in-place order uh, due to COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So let's get started with that little explanation. Uh, as I was preparing for this sermon, many things were different than I expected they would be. Um, I chose this week to preach because my husband Andrew was supposed to be on travel the week prior, so I thought I'd have a good chunk of quiet time and I would do a lot of good work this week. I also thought I would get my hair cut. This is a little bit intolerable for me. And I thought I would kind of connect with some friends while he was away. But none of these things happened. Uh, instead, I'm not talking to you in person like I thought I was, but here at home. Um, I'd so much rather talk with you face to face. And so much has changed so quickly, hasn't it? Um, there's a lot of ambiguity in the world right now because of this COVID-19 situation. And so there's a lot of questions that we're asking as well. People want to know, like, how long is school going to be out? And how long will social distancing be required? When can I get my hair cut? Uh, will I be able to visit elderly family members who are in far away states? What will happen to the economy? Will downtown be permanently scarred from this? Will businesses have to close? Um, how long are we going to be doing church in our homes? How long will this all last? Uh, will my friend get his job back? Will my mortgage or my rent be relieved during this season? Um, we just started praying in neighborhood groups. What are we going to do with that? And what about small groups? I was in a good one and we can't meet in person anymore. So these are all big, heavy questions, and no one has the answers right now, unfortunately. Not the doctors, not the government, and not myself, and probably not you. Uh, so some of us, when we are living in this ambiguous situation, when some things are so uncertain like it is now, we can also feel some big feelings, like anxiety and fear, scarcity and competition, greed and self-protection and loneliness because we can't see our friends. And when things are uncertain, it's really easy to feel out of control and scared. So what do we do with big feelings and big questions? How do Christians live without answers but with high emotions? Well, friends, I'm just so thankful that God has provided us with the book of Job in such a time as this. I think we need it. I think we need to hear a word from the Lord about who he is and what he does and what we can do with big feelings when everything seems wrong. And I'm going to love the book of Job because it's a book of hard questions, brave honesty, and passionate integrity. Job doesn't hold back. Instead, he lets it all out. And God, um, God ends up praising him for this at the end of the book. Job wants answers from God. He demands a response. And oddly, God shows up and gives him one. That's great. I want that too sometimes. <laughs> and so more than that, God declares that Job is blameless at the end of the book. And he was blameless when he was seeking these answers from God. So I think we can learn from this and that it can help us deal with the current weirdness that we're all living in and feeling. And if Job brought his big feelings to God and God loved and praised Job for it, I want to know more. We've already heard in the two sermons that Curtis preached uh, the past two weeks that other people had opinions about why Job was in the situation he was in. So he has three friends. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and they all thought that Job had sinned, and so he was being punished for something he'd done. They relied on their experience, their tradition, and reason to make this determination, but they all lacked wisdom. And then last week, we met Elihu, or Elihu, I don't know, and he claimed to have received a revelation. He took his own words, and he sanctified them, saying that they were from the Lord when they were not. Not the best idea. 
So all four of these friends failed to understand that wisdom is the fear of the Lord, not trusting in what you learn by experience or tradition or your own reason or revelation. Remember what we learned a few months prior to this in Ecclesiastes, that just because something is true most of the time does not mean it's true all of the time. Wisdom is the ability to determine when a proverb or fact applies and when it doesn't. At the end of the book of Job, these friends end up on the wrong side of God's judgment. And this is a sharp contrast to Job, who God praises, saying that Job spoke accurately about God. So God praises Job and says that Job will intercede for his friends, and then God will forgive the friends. So what did Job do that his friends didn't? And how did Job deal with this situation in a different way than his friends did, such that God declared it good? First, what do we know about Job from the book? Who is this guy? So let's look into the first two chapters and see what we can find out about Job. The first thing we learn is that Job lives in Uz, some place outside of Israel. So he's not Jewish. The second thing we learn is that he is blameless and upright. He avoids evil and he fears God. And this must be pretty important if it's one of the first few things that we hear. And then the third thing we hear is that Job is ridiculously wealthy. He has complete abundance in, and wholeness in children, livestock, servants, and possessions. He's got all, everything he needs. The man is loaded. Now, if we are good, First Testament Jews, this is actually a way of repeating the second thing we learned. We're, what we're hearing is that Job is blessed, and we know that people who walk with God are blessed. So these material possessions are a sign to us that Job is blessed. God is rewarding Job for his faithfulness. Everything checks out. But remember, Job lives in Uz, outside of Israel, so he's not even Jewish. And the Lord is blessing him like this for all of his faithfulness. That's pretty incredible, so Job must be the real deal. Next, we learn that Job serves as a priest for his household, and that he is very faithful in this service. He sacrifices regularly and often for sins his kids might have committed. I don't really do that for myself. Perhaps I should learn something. So Job values holiness so much that he takes on extra time and extra cost to atone for potential sins that may have been committed by others in his household. He's dedicated to the Lord. You and I know what happens next. Job loses everything in one day. All of his possessions, all of his children, all of his servants, they're all gone. And he tears his robe and he shaves his head, which is a sign of grief. And he says something amazing, which is essentially, I came into this world with nothing and I'm going to leave with nothing. Everything in the middle is the Lord's. Praise the Lord. And then the text tells us something interesting. It says that in all of this, Job did not sin. He's still blameless. He's still righteous. This cycle repeats in chapter 2, only this time Job gets sick and he experiences suffering in his body. He still does not sin and he's still blameless. So the first thing that we learn about Job is that he loves the Lord and he orients his life around God. Job walks in God's ways and he understands the one that he worships. Job is a picture of faithfulness. He is blameless because the text tells us he is. So Job is blameless, but he's also human. And he has big feelings and some dark words. The man is angry. He's depressed. He hates his circumstances. He wants to go back to the way things were. And he'd rather die than live in all of this pain and shame. He wants to take God to court and get a response and some explanations for what is happening. He's very passionate. Job knows that God is involved 
and he wants answers. So as Job is wrestling through these big feelings, grief, anger, depression, despair, he's asking one main question. Why has this happened to him? Job knows what we know, that he's blameless. And he also, before all of this happened, had the same worldview that his friends had. He believed in the same God, that God blesses those who walk in his ways and he punishes those who do not. But, but what does he do with now? Now he can't make sense of things. He is experiencing something that is completely opposite of his beliefs. And his beliefs and his experience aren't matching up. If Job was innocent, if he really was blameless, why is he being punished? Job has searched his soul and he has found no sin that he should repent of. He vigorously maintains his innocence while his friends yammer on about how there's probably something he missed and he needs to look deeper and just repent. But Job knows that he's blameless. So why are things happening? Why are bad things happening to this good person? You and I both know something that Job doesn't. Um, God has allowed Job to be tested. We know that the accuser is testing Job to see if a human can love God for who God is or for the stuff that God gives us. Job is never going to get this information. Instead, he ends up doing some deep work and coming to the realization that life is more complicated than he originally thought. Job learns through this experience that God makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. Job's friends never get this. But most importantly, while working through this, Job continues to point his words toward God. Job prays and pleads and muses on God and what God is doing while he's working through these big feelings. Job loves God and he seeks God in his suffering. So when we are suffering, can we turn our feelings to God? Can we wrestle with big questions with God? Can we remain connected to the giver of life when it feels like life is giving way? God, at the end of the book, is going to state that Job is his servant and he has spoken accurately about God. So what are some of the things that Job says about God? Job believes God is powerful, and what else does he say? Well, first, he says that, jo that God is wise, mighty, and strong. He says God is the source of wisdom. God is the watcher of humanity and the maker of people. God is the source of Job's life events. God is the all-powerful creator. God is gracious. God is the source of Job's hope. God makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. And ultimately, Job brings his troubles to God. For those of you watching the video, uh, there's a link to a text of this sermon, and I've got Bible verses for you there if you'd like to dig deeper. Job knows that God is the source of wisdom, which is why he continues to orient himself toward God. Perhaps God will help him understand what's happening. Job says in chapter 28, But wisdom, where can it be found? Where is the place of understanding? Humankind does not know its value. It isn't found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not with me. And the sea says, it's not alongside me. But God understands her way. He knows her place. And he looks to the ends of the, the earth and surveys everything beneath the heavens. In order to weigh the wind, to prepare a measure for waters, when he made a decree for the rain, a path for thunderbolts, then he observed it, spoke of it, established it, searched it out, and said to humankind, Look, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. Turning from evil is understanding. Throughout Job's many speeches, he addresses his complaints, requests, and his emotions toward God. Often there's a searching or a questioning to his words, 
He doesn't have all the answers, and he's working out the answers to the questions with God. As Job works through his grief and his other big feelings, he starts to long for the intimacy and connection that he felt with God previously. Job yearns for the previous days when he felt cared for by God, when he felt God's presence. In chapter 29, he writes, Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head, and his light, and by his light I walked through the darkness. I was in my prime when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, and my children were all around me, when my steps were washed with butter, and the rock poured out streams of oil. Job misses God. He misses the things in life that were signs of God's presence with him a sense of walking in God's ways, a connection to the wisdom or friendship of God, and when God revealed his relationship with Job through physical blessings. Think of that. This wealthy man had children to help him run his family business, and it made life feel easy. All of the hard and the rough edges were smoothed out and lubricated such that things went easily for Job. And remember, Job understood that these blessings were signs that God was with him. Job believed that God blessed righteous people. But now Job's coming to realize that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So in Job's final complaint, he longs for the good old days, and he says, I cry to you, and you don't answer. I stand up, but you just look at me. Now he feels alone. God seems far off. And that is what hurts the worst. If only God were near so that Job could talk to him. If only they were in court and Job could lay his accusations against God and hear his response. If only God would come near and intervene in all of this pain. Oddly enough, that's exactly what God does. He shows up, and it's not a courtroom, and Job doesn't get to state his case. You see, Job has already stated his case because God has been listening this whole time. Even though it felt like God was far off, it turns out that he was near, and he was listening and watching over Job. Also, remember that God set a limit for the accuser in the beginning of the story. The accuser could make Job suffer physically, but he couldn't take his life. Job has been despairing, feeling like he's near death, and saying so quite forcefully. But we know that that's a feeling and not a reality. Job will not die for, from this ordeal because the boundary has been set by God. Even in all of this pain, God is preserving Job. So when God shows up, he makes two long speeches about what God does. God sort of explains to Job what is in his job description, and then he basically asks, if you think you know so much, would you like to give it a go for a day? God pauses after each speech, and he allows Job to respond. God is gracious. He gives Job the last word. God finishes talking, and then he allows his servant to speak last. How many of us do that? And now, how does Job respond? He says very little. And this is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So Job essentially says, I have nothing to say. I've already said too much. Job is having an encounter with God, and he's smart enough to keep his mouth shut. The second time, Job responds to God in chapter 42 by saying, I know you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be opposed successfully. You said, Who is this darkening my counsel without knowledge? I have indeed spoken about things I did not understand, wonders beyond my comprehension, you said, listen, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will inform me. 
My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. Basically, Job is admitting who is who. God is powerful and mighty, and Job isn't. God is the source of wisdom. Job isn't. God is God, and Job isn't. What Job is saying here is that he spoke about things that he didn't really know or understand fully. It's like he was looking through a foggy window, and then it clears, and he can see the picture clearly. Or it's like the movie, The Sixth Sense. You're watching a coherent story and then one line changes everything and the meaning starts shifting. All of a sudden you mentally review all the stuff that happened earlier in the movie and you come to realize that what you thought you were seeing, while still accurate, didn't mean exactly what you thought it meant. And so the things you were seeing weren't false, but they weren't clear or fully revealed. This is what's happening to Job. His encounter with God peels back the curtain so he can understand and see more clearly than he did before. So he's not apologizing for what he said earlier, but Job is admitting that he only knew and understood in part. Now he knows more. The, su the stuff he said before is still true, but now it has a different tone and a new richness. Job confesses to God that he only knew in part, but that now he knows more fully, and then he shuts up. This, again, is wisdom. Job is humbling himself before the king of the universe. He's admitting who is who and what is what. It wasn't wrong for Job to speak about what he knew before, but it's also right for him to admit that he learned more. Job says, my ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. May we be as quick to admit when new information changes our understanding. What does this mean for us now? What should we do with all of this? The story of Job is a classic Christian story. It's a story of a man who was upright and blameless, who was a servant of God, and he lost everything, and he suffered unjustly. This is a story of a suffering servant. But we know what happens to suffering servants. We've heard this story before, and we've heard it in Isaiah and the New Testament. It's the story of Jesus, a man who was upright and blameless, who suffered unjustly. This man was a servant of God. And we know that God restores suffering servants, and that he raised Jesus on the third day. And somehow, in the beautiful mystery of God, Job tasted this future story way back when he was living. Job said, as he was living it out for us so that we'd recognize the future story when it happened later, he boldly claims in chapter 29, I know that my Redeemer is alive. And afterward, he'll rise up on the dust. After my skin has been torn apart this way, then from my flesh I'll see God, whom I'll see myself, my eyes, and not a stranger's. Job beautifully claims that he himself will see God again. We know the true meaning of these words because our Redeemer lives. And in two weeks, we get to celebrate that truth. Till then, may the lesson of Job be a comfort to us in these weird and crazy times. Remember, God can handle your big feelings and your fears. Work through these feelings and this experience with God. Remember that God is with us in this situation and he'll be with us in the next. God may seem far off but he's listening, and he may respond in a way that we don't expect. But most importantly, he lives. Amen.